This is the story of how humans came to the conclusion that our solar system is heliocentric. A heliocentric solar system is one in which the sun is the center of gravity, while the earth and all the planets orbit around it. While the fact that the Sun is the center of our solar system is common knowledge today, it took 1,000 years of observation and theory for the correct model to be found. Cosmologists are scientists who theorize and observe the universe in order to better understand its nature and origins. The first cosmologist was a man named Thales of Miletus in ancient Greece, who lived in the 5th century BCE. He looked out at a seemingly infinite ocean and concluded that the water was the primary constituent of the universe and that the earth simply floated in an endless ocean of existence. While other theories came into being over the course of the following century, it was not until a mathematician and philosopher named Pythagoras came along that people had any idea that the earth was in fact spherical. Pythagoras drew this revolutionary conclusion for four reasons. The Earth casts a circular shadow on the moon during lunar eclipses. Constellations change when you move from north to south. Boats disappear over the horizon, and because spheres are perfect geometric forms, In Pythagoras' cosmology, Earth is the only imperfect sphere, as it is mountainous. The celestial spheres, however, the Sun, Moon, stars, and planets, are all truly perfect spheres because they are closer to the heavens. Then, Plato comes along. He piggybacks on the idea of the celestial spheres, but modifies it by theorizing that all celestial spheres, including the Sun, rotate around the Earth. At the time, this made perfect sense, because when we look up at the sky, it appears as though the Sun, Moon, and stars are orbiting around us. This is the first geocentric model. Geo meaning Earth, as in geography or geology, and centric meaning at the center of. Interestingly enough, around the same time, Aristarchus, another Greek thinker, theorized that the Sun was the center of the universe. He did so by calculating the size of the Sun, the Earth, and the planets. Upon realizing that the Sun was the largest of the spheres by far, Aristarchus concluded that it was only logical for the Earth and the planets to go around the Sun. End of story. Actually, not so much. Consider how a proposition like this would seem to a population of geocentrists. People liked believing that the Earth was the center of the universe because it made them feel significant. In addition, the geocentric model aligned itself more intuitively with the dominant religious systems at the time. Most people just weren't ready to accept that they were insignificant in the context of the universe. Enter the big man himself, Aristotle, a student of Plato and an advocate for geocentrism. His argument was based around stellar parallax. Parallax is the phenomenon that makes an object appear to have moved after having been viewed from two vantage points. The idea was that if the Earth rotated around the Sun, it would change its position over time. As a result, Aristotle claims that the stars would appear in a different place in the sky at different points along the Earth's rotation because they would be being viewed from different vantage points. However, stars did not appear to move. Therefore, the Earth could not be moving. This argument seemed to put a nail in the coffin of heliocentrism. Aristotle's student, Alexander the Great, spread his teacher's ideas throughout Europe and Asia on his conquests. There was 
one chink, however, in the geocentrist's armor. The sun, the moon, and the stars all appear to move around the Earth, but the planets do not. At different points during the year, planets seem to turn around and move backwards in the sky, and at the time, nobody knew why. This phenomenon is called retrograde motion. Claudius Ptolemy, a Greco-Roman living in Egypt, came up with the theory of epicycles to account for retrograde motion. He theorized that in their orbits around the Earth, the planets move in many orbits or epicycles. This would account for the planet's backward motion. This geocentric epicycle model, while overly complicated, thrived under the Pope's protection throughout the Middle Ages and into the Renaissance. This is until the Copernican Revolution. In the 16th century, Nicholas Copernicus posited that the Earth was in fact orbiting around the Sun, as were the planets. This model naturally explained retrograde motion. As we, along with other planets, orbit the Sun, it appears as though the other planets turn around and move backwards in the sky due to the pattern of our respective orbits. Copernicus countered Aristotle's stellar parallax argument by hypothesizing that stars were too far away from Earth for parallax to be observed. Copernicus's heliocentrism was the best scientific model thus far, as it not only fulfilled all the criteria derived from observation, but was an extremely simple explanation. Copernicus's ideas became very popular. However, due to a miscalculation, his numbers didn't come out right, and he reverted back to an even more complicated heliocentric model. A half century later, an Italian astronomer by the name of Galileo Galilei built a telescope and used it to prove Copernicus's original heliocentric model. First, with the power of his telescope, he was able to see thousands more stars than was possible with the naked eye. This proved that there was much more to the universe than people had originally thought, making it unlikely that the Earth was the center of it. He then pointed his telescope at the moon and saw mountains and geography on it, just like there is on Earth. This disproved the idea that Earth was significant in its imperfections. He also discovered four moons orbiting Jupiter. This proved that not everything orbited the Earth. The final factor was the discovery that the way the Sun shines onto Venus proved that it orbited the Sun. Galileo's discoveries finally cemented the dominance of the heliocentric worldview.